Thanks, everybody. I'm surprised this many people showed up. Thanks. That's that was really awesome. I forgot I'd be talking to myself and maybe Claudine and Zen Doodles here. So thank you for coming. That's great. Um, so about me, uh, I'm not going to get into a lot about me because this presentation is going to kind of be about my journey through the Drupal community. So you're going to kind of get to know way more than you probably wanted to know about me. But it should be kind of fun. We'll talk about some great moments in Drupal history and some stuff like that. Um, but for those who don't know who I am, um, I'm, I'm pretty much Drupal obsessed, <laughs> would be the way to put it. So, you know, I'm a core committer for the Drupal project. I'm one of like seven people who can make changes to Drupal core. Um, I wrote a book. I wrote a second edition. I am not writing a third edition. So if anybody would like to take using Drupal for uh, Drupal 8, let me know. Um, I work at Acquia for the Office of the CTO, and Dries Bytart, the uh, project lead, is my boss, which is pretty awesome. Um, and I'm a board member for the Drupal Association. I'm a cat herder. I was on a magazine once, blah, blah, blah. And I don't do all this just to like, you know, pump myself up and make me look good, because really what I'm trying to communicate here is like, I am someone who dedicates my life to Drupal, and I love it, and I love every second of it, and I think I'm the kind of person, not me personally, but you know, we want to cultivate more people like that in our community, more people who you know, look at Drupal and they say, man, this is what I want to do, and this is really what gives me jazzed up in the morning and that kind of thing. So I'm going to kind of talk about how that happened with me and hope that we can kind of extrapolate from there some general lessons that can be applied to many different communities, not just open source communities. So, so this is me in about uh, 1983. My dad playing guitar. That was the last time I ever wore a dress, by the way. Um, yeah, so around this age, maybe that was really early. I was reading when I was like one. It was kind of crazy. Um, but anyway, we got a VIC 20. Anybody remember this thing? This yes, awesome. Yeah, it's like this huge friggin' keyboard you plug into the TV, and then, you know, like. So they had all these little cartridges you could plug in to the sides, like, you know. Jupiter Lander, and I don't know, there was a mouse maze game thing. Um, but one of them was basic. And so uh, I would read in the back of 321 Contact magazines, and they'd have these like 30,000 lines of code you'd type them in, and then you could like make a recipe for chicken soup or something. And I don't know. <laughs> so I'd like type these things in, and then I would like change them and see what that did, and sort of like modifying and stuff. And it was, you know, that's kind of how I got into technology and learned how to code. That's also how I became completely obsessed with video games. Uh, and that's a skill that has served me well to this very day. Um, but that really did nurture an interest in technology for me, like, lifelong. I, like, wanted to know, how do you do video games? And it turns out it's a lot of math, so I kind of didn't do it. But, you know, the point is, um, it really kept me interested in healthy, you know, the addiction to video games kind of got me interested in technology, kept me into it into my adult years. So, you know, one of the lessons learned here is you need to get people while they're young, you know? It, nurture kids' interest in technology early, and especially girls, okay? A lot of people are like, oh, why would you say especially girls? Whatever. We're all equal, open source, hippie, yay. It's like, no. Uh, the, problem is, um, the problem is that society doesn't treat women the same. So from early age, you know, a girl's role models are pretty much like Disney princesses. Do you know what a Disney princess's like, big you know, talent is? It seems to be like falling asleep and getting kissed. That's pretty much the only thing they're bringing to the table there. So this is who you're, uh, you're kind of looking up to. And then your whole life, you're kind of told that your role in, you know, in the universe is to be a caregiver, a nurturer, a homemaker, you know, push towards feminine jobs, nursing, this kind of thing. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, per se, but it becomes a problem when that's sort of the mold that you're sort of pushed into. And if you don't conform to that mold, then you're sort of seen as an outcast type of thing. And then it's interesting, because whenever you see a woman next to a computer, she's normally doing this. You know, it's like, oh God, it's so complicated. Why couldn't a man come and explain this confounded thing to me? You know, uh, she's never, you know, unless she's Angelina Jolie in Hackers, for example. Um, you know, typically not really uh, on the computer doing awesome things, mostly being frustrated by it. You know, banging her face, pulling her hair, this kind of thing. And then on the rare opportunity that you know women in technology do mix, they typically look like this. You know, so it's sort of like from very early age, there's just sort of this, you know message from all around you that technology is for boys and it's not really something you should be getting into. Um, and then if you do manage to get through all of that and still become interested in technology, then you have this. So every time that you go to an event or you go to a meetup or something, there's some people that are so confounded that there's a female person in the room who actually like cares about computers and they think you're some kind of weird multi-headed unicorn or something. Um, and then you also have this problem 
which is, you know, a survey was sent out, it's called the Floss Pulse Survey, and it's actually a really fascinating survey. It's a few years ago, so this may not be accurate anymore, but they asked the question, have you ever observed discriminatory behavior against women in open source? And all the men and the women answers are completely inverse. In other words, men and women are experiencing or observing the same behaviors and the same actions and the same words, things being said, and interpreting the results completely differently. I have a pretty good example of this. Um, when I was at the Floss Pol or sorry, uh, Flourish Conf in Chicago in 2007 or something, um, it's a Linux conference, so there was a bunch of open source people there, and I was speaking about women in open source, ironically. Um, and there was a girl there who's like just hardcore, like, I don't know, ran her own servers and all kinds of stuff. She knows, like, I don't really know much about Linux other than the basics because I run a server on DreamHost, so I know how to LS and CD and I know VI and some other things, but it's not like I'm like, you know, setting up my own DNS servers and stuff like this. But anyway, she was that kind of person. We were just chit-chatting. And this guy came over because he was using, I don't know, I think he was using Windows too, like, idiot. No, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he came over because he was having a problem with his Wi-Fi connection. So he comes to me because he knew I was on the speaker list, so figured I would know something about it. You know, and I was like, oh, uh, let me look at this, you know. And he turns to her and he goes, oh, we're talking about computers here, right? So to him, that was fine because it's safe for him to make an assumption that if a girl's here, she must obviously be somebody's boyfriend or, you know, like maybe she's the help who's running around and, you know, putting out coffee for people. But she found that like super offensive because here he's talking to kind of the Linux dummy, honestly, about this kind of problem that he was having. And here is this super technical person happy wearing lipstick and suddenly that just invalidated everything that she had. So it happens a lot. Um, so do try, especially if you have a daughter. I'm going to have a daughter soon and I plan to get her involved in technology. Yay! She'll probably be a cheerleader. Oh, I might need help with makeup and show stuff. Choir. Yes. Show choir. My daughter just in what? Show choir. Show choir? Yes. Don't even know what that is. Please. Singing please. and dancing. Yes. Hmm. Yes. We did that yes. once. Sparkly dresses. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Please. Sparkles, oh God, anyway. It's a whole nother world, yeah. I was going to ask you if, yeah, I was going to say, these are the things that I know about, but what are other ones? Mine? <laughs> okay. Okay, so wait for the recording. Um, this gentleman in the back, Lee, um, he was saying uh, Minecraft is actually a really good option for introducing kids to programming. By the way, this is Jess. <laughs> um, uh, 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 because uh, I don't know, something about resources to build logs, or I don't know what you said, but, you know, but it sort of like teaches kids the logic they need in order to sort of, that builds them into programming because you're problem solving and trying to get different supplies to build different things. And you were gonna add? Whoops. That uh, you can actually use the, the uh, command line and you can um, edit your, your environment and everything through it and you can program for Minecraft. Awesome. Yes. Okay, so I wrote that down. <laughs> Any other resources people are aware of? Because, you know, I'd... Scratch. Scratch? Okay. Awesome. I'm gonna to come to my next presentation with half-finished slides and everyone can just give me the answers in the room. That's great. Okay, so there you go. Um, but great thing to go find kids that are kind of interested in technology. You, you know, if you're here, you're probably at least somewhat technical because God, how could you stand Drupal if you weren't? Um, so, you know, go find some kids and show them how to do awesome things with Drupal. So, I, I did a spoiler alert, but yeah, this is me in 1995. <laughs> I, used to, I used to be a total metalhead. I listened to like, so I would go to concerts like Metallica and Megadeth and Pantera with my mom, and my mom would like stay out in the, uh, in the uh, lobby doing crossword puzzles, and I would like go to the show in the mosh pit and stuff, and then I'd come back. Anyway, we had a lot of fun. Um, so around this time is when I got my first computer, and it was a penny, like my real computer, because the VIC-20 is not really a computer. So it was a Packard Bell Pentium 133 with a 14.4K modem. Yes. <laughs> and suddenly I discovered the internet, and that was completely amazing. Um, it totally blew my mind. So, like, 
that was kind of in this small town in Minnesota. I didn't really know anyone. I was pretty sure I was gay. It was like a whole thing. Um, the internet allowed me to meet people who weren't in a small, closed-minded, little white bread town and actually expand my horizons. And so I proceeded then to learn everything there was to know about how the internet worked because I was just fascinated by it. So, you know, I taught myself how to build computers, how to build networks, um, you know, I taught myself programming and web development and blah, 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 security, everything there was to know because I was just fascinated by this topic. And so naturally, very shortly after I started getting involved in all this, I learned about Linux. Um, I first installed Linux in 1995 or 6, I can't remember. But anyway, the, the first version of uh, Linux I successfully installed was Debian Rex, which fit on seven floppy disks. I don't think Debian fits on seven, like, not even DVDs, like seven terabytes worth of, I don't know, like, yeah, it's, it's huge. So, yeah, so I mean, this is, I was in bug. And so, you know, I got into Linux and I thought that was really cool, this whole open source thing and how it's, you know, like, wow, you know, you, these smart people all work on this technology, they give it away for free to other people to learn from it and, and expand it. So naturally I started looking up to some of these guys. So like Linus Torvalds, Richard Stallman, Eric S. Raymond, Kevin Mitnick, you know, these, these guys are all like really big thought leaders in the open source community at the time. And, you know, all kinds of stuff about freedom and, and giving things away. So, of course, having role models like this, the first thing that I thought I knew about open source was this, right? That the only people who contributed to open source were like super genius people. And I was just like a mere cheerleader at the side, sort of like cheering them on, and that would be my only role in open source. So that's what I thought in 1995. Um, how many people here, by the way, still believe this right now? Yeah, right? Yeah, it's easy to get that way, right? You see Dree standing up there with his very intimidating spiky hair and, you know. <laughs> um, or me with my intimidating shirt. Yes. <laughs> it's gray. Ooh, no. Um, you know, and, and so, oh, Morton, you missed the best picture, man. <laughs> Hold on, I have to go back and show this because. All right. This was me. Holy. <laughs> 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 All right. We're done with that now. <laughs> Back in the day. So yeah, so I thought this for a long time, so I totally don't fault anyone who thinks this, but you know, so I thought that this is what happened, you know. You had Gina the genius out there somewhere, right? And she's a genius, so her head is like the size of a friggin' watermelon, right? And all she does all day is like sit there and ponder herself, you know, I have this brilliant idea, you know, for this new feature for this piece of software. So I'm gonna whip out my text editor. Hey, there we go. Um, which is probably Emacs. Anyway, and then I'm going to type up type this thing, and then everyone around me is going to go, wow, that's amazing, and that is your best work yet. How many people think that that is how contribution in open source happens? Yes. Okay, good, because that's not at all what happens, okay? Here is what actually happens. So you have Edwina, the end user. Oh, no, did you <laughs> seriously? Okay, I'll go fast. All right, and she's really peeved because she just hit a bug. So she goes to the issue queue and she files a bug report that explains her problem. That might be the last thing that she ever does for the Drupal community, but if she submitted a bug report that made sense to someone else, that is a huge contribution to open source she has just done. Because you don't know how many bug reports you get that it's like, it's broke, <laughs> or you suck. Yes, exactly. Um, so a bug report that makes sense, that's a very valuable open source contribution. Then Paula the programmer wanders around and she hit the same bug. She searches the issue queue and she goes, oh, look, it's a bug report and uh, I can fix that, so let me try. So she posts what's called a patch and marks it needs review. And then Tatiana the tester comes along and she's a tester and she has big Coke bottle glasses because she just looks at bugs all day. Um, <laughs> and she looks at her code and she says, what is going on there, you know, because it's not real great, like there's problems with it. So she says, okay, well, let me post some feedback. So she might say stuff like, you know, your coding standards are a bit off, don't forget test coverage, and you know, there's a better way to do this algorithm that you did here, try it this way instead. And so she'll post feedback and market needs work. Paula says, great, let me uh, do that, thanks, take two. By the way, a lot of people are scared to do this part. They don't wanna put other people down, like they don't wanna, you know, it's like, well, you know, Paula probably worked really hard on that patch, why would I kinda criticize her work, right? The problem is, if Paula posts this thing, and, and nobody responds, that's way worse. It's way worse to like put something out there and feel like nobody cares than it is to put something out there and get constructive feedback on how to make yourself better. So always think of it as your role is to help that person get better, make their code better, make the product better, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, 
Then you have Wendy, the poor soul stuck on Windows XP. And do you know what she says? You know what she says. She says it breaks in IE6. And also mind your spelling. Because the only reason that she's using XP is because it runs that one version of Word that she needs because she's a book author. And so, you know, whatever. Um, so she marks it need work. Uh, so Paula says, all right, one more time, needs review. Tatiana comes back, and she looks at it, she says, wow, much better. Not only did you incorporate my feedback, but your spelling's all cleaned up. That's wonderful. And so she marks it reviewed and tested. And then it will go to someone like myself or Dries or whoever the project maintainer is, and then they'll do one final check over, and then it gets in, usually. Um, so that's how it is. And the thing to keep, take away from this is no one person did this themselves. Everybody in this scenario contributed something, whether it was a typo fix or whether it was the initial bug report, whatever it was. And every single change in Drupal, from like a new database abstraction layer to like uh, rewording of the documentation somewhere, goes through this process, and it's every single person contributing the little bit of information that they know. So the lesson to take away from here is we must destroy Einstein, okay? Because the problem with the Einstein complex is that it affects people who are already really excited about what you're doing, right? Like, I love Linux. I was a, the biggest Linux fan ever, and I like talked about Linux to all my friends and family and stuff, but like I didn't think I could contribute to it because that was not my role, right? Um, but here I was, this really excited person. It worked out okay, because I didn't want to get involved in Linux and not Drupal, and I like what I'm doing now, but you know what I mean? It's, it's like, there's people that you have to convince to contribute to you, then there's people out there that want to contribute to you but don't feel like they're good enough. We need to stop that and get those people powered up and ready to go. So one way that we've tried to address this in the Drupal community is through novice issues. So we take issues, we basically have the, sort of this rule that's like, if that's gonna take you five minutes or less to fix, don't fix it. Instead, file it as a novice issue, so tag it with novice. And then what'll happen is somebody else can go along and that thing that was gonna take you five minutes to fix, that might take them a week to fix. But the important thing is they learn a lot through that process. They learn what Git is, they know how to set up a development environment, they learn about the coding standards, that kind of thing. Um, and this has actually worked pretty well, I think. Um, you know, we, we definitely, like I, my experience has been as soon as I file a novice task, within two days it's taken care of. So there's, there's people out there hovering, waiting for stuff to work on. So if you find yourself in the position where you're doing a code audit and you notice some stupid thing that's like, ugh, it's not even worth filing an issue about, please file an issue because somebody will do it and they'll have a really fun time with it. So in 2005, I was sporting the tank girl bangs. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and you wouldn't recognize me back in 2005. Back in 2005, I was extremely, extremely shy and awkward and weird. I'm still weird, but I'm a little less shy. Um, more awkward though, but anyway, um, but the point is like I, you know, the thought of getting up in front of a room like this would make me like physically sick, like I couldn't do anything like this um, back then. Um, so it's interesting because the role that Drupal has played in transforming, it's not even transforming me as a person, it's more like allowing me to be the person I always was, but giving a safe place for that, I'm gonna be grateful to Drupal forever. So how that started was, there's a program called Google Summer of Code back in 2005, um, and this was the only thing that broke down the Einstein complex for me because it said, oh, you're a student, so you wanna to contribute to open source. And I was like, oh, okay, so if, if they know we're students, they know we don't know everything yet, so maybe I can do that. And somehow, at the, like the 11th hour, somehow I got chosen. I was just about to get dropped off the list, but he flipped it at the last second, so thanks, Robert Douglas. But anyway, um, I was about to not get chosen. I did get selected. And then, you know, I was like, holy crap. So I chose Drupal uh, as my project for Google Summer of Code because uh, I had seen it on the Spread Firefox project and I'm one of those people that just goes around and clicks view source on every page that I visit. <laughs> I just want to see what's going on under there. Um, yeah, so I got accepted and that, that worked out pretty well. Um, so the lesson I took away from this is, is mentoring plus plus. If you have like a well-lit entrance for people to come into your project, um, that's, that's really, really good thing to have. Uh, how many people here have as much money as Google? Right, okay, so, so we don't have as much money as Google either, but here are some ways that we have tackled mentoring in the, uh, in the Drupal community. Uh, so one is, is what's called drupalofficehours.org, and Jess sort of spearheaded this program, now Zen Doodles works on it, and there's a bunch of, like, sort of a cluster of people uh, working on this. Um, and what it is is they sort of pre-select uh, kind of low-hanging fruit issues, maybe not novice level of triviality, but pretty decent ones, and they sort of get 
input from, I'm, I'm very nervous with you in the room, I'm gonna say something wrong, but anyway. And then you come into IRC one of two time slots a week. We do one in the morning and one in the evening so that somewhere around the world you always have a time slot that works for you. Um, and uh, they're right up there, the times. Uh, and then, you know, someone will hand you a task to work on, they'll help you. So they answer questions. There's no dumb questions you can't ask during this time. This is the time to ask, I don't know what Git is, can you help me out? And they'll help you with resources, you know, with all kinds of stuff like that. And these are real core developers who are having like this, you know, it's, it's really, a, it's a unique thing I have not seen in any other project, so that's pretty awesome. Um, crowdsourcing is another way we do mentoring. So this is the Drupal ladder, and there's a presentation on this tomorrow morning, I think, by Addy. Uh, so definitely check it out. So how this works is it's sort of a go-at-your-own-pace self-curriculum thing where they've bundled up all of the ways to do different things like test a patch, write a patch, and it sort of goes from easiest to hardest. And then each one of these is a self-contained little unit of information. You can take this to your Drupal user group meetings or whatever you want to do and sort of, you know, hold little contribution sprints all over the world. Um, so they have a really great goal by Portland to do do you know, Jess, is it like 20 different cities or something like that? I, I, I've forgotten the numbers, but they yeah. have like a, a set of a very long-term outline of their goals for each, each phase, six weeks, six months, and a year from now, and then on. Yeah, so they're, it's like 20 or 24, yeah. So they have a set, like, they have different goals set up for sp different periods of time to try and, like, spread the word about this program, because it's really, really awesome. Um, and then we also have a peer tutoring program called the Drupal Dojo, and I don't know if this has been as active recently, um, but the premise of it is amazing. It's basically like you get up and you get on some kind of a screen sharing program, you share whatever bit of Drupal information you know. So maybe you're a Drupal 8 initiative owner talking about that, or you're someone who just finally figured out how to make a blog in Drupal and you talk about that, or whatever it is, but people helping each other to learn Drupal, and that was a really successful program. Um, so my first five minutes in the Drupal IRC channel went a little like this. So I came in and I'm all like sunshine and rainbows. I'm like, hi everybody! My name is Angie and I'm so excited because I'm a Google Summer of Code student and I can't wait to work with you. Shut up! You know, it was like, this is a channel for serious developers only, go away. And then I spent the next day hiding under a blanket. Um, this was really painful, you know, because I was so excited to finally cross that threshold as an open source contributor. I was extremely vulnerable because I had this Einstein complex, uh, you know. So the full lesson learned here is full frontal nicety. Because honestly, if I hadn't been contractually obligated to work with Drupal at that point, I probably would have split, you know? That's not cool. You don't talk to people like that. So I've kind of spent the next, you know, however many years of my life trying to make sure that doesn't happen to anyone ever again. Um, but you need to change your assumptions and you need to assume, even if that newbie is kind of obnoxious and being stupid in the development channel, you know, try and help them or try and guide them to where they need to be. Um, because you never know. That person could turn out to be your next core committer. Who knows? Um, and you also need to really be careful of this, okay? Because when you're a jerk to somebody, you're not just being a jerk to that person, you're also being a jerk to anyone who witnessed that behavior, okay? And that includes newbies and contributors alike. So if you're a jerk in IRC, there's 300 people in there that all see that happen. And the response the community does in response to that is really important. Because if somebody calls someone a jerk and tells them to RTFM and the person leaves, and the person says, ha, 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 so smug. I told that newbie off, ha. And nobody sees someone come back and say, dude, that was not cool. Or girl, that was not cool. Um, then they get the impression that that is actually condoned behavior and this is not a friendly community and I'm out of here. So it's really important that you not only don't be a jerk to people, but if you see other people doing a jerk, call them out on it. Um, one of the best things we did, and this was Mosh actually that led this thing, is it would totally rip off the Ubuntu code of conduct. Because um, it's a great code of conduct. It basically establishes the ground rules for what we expect people to work like, at, work like in the community. And this is really important because if someone's being a jerk, you can say, you know, I, someone was a jerk to me and we can say, oh, that's not actually cool. This is how we're supposed to behave. And that was out of line with our community and it gives them a way to be reassured that that was kind of a one-off. You're always going to get those people that are sort of in a cranky mood. Um, but it's important that they are able to contextualize that and say that was a one-off versus that's a systemic way that this community behaves. And one thing I especially like about the Ubuntu Code of Conduct is it's phrased positively. So in other words, it's like, let's itemize the things that we want to see. We want people to be considerate. We want them to be respectful. Because if you start going the other way and saying, like, we don't want you to be insulting, we don't want you to say, then somebody is inevitably going to say, well, you didn't say we couldn't kickbox the newbies, so I don't know what you're so mad about. 
So yeah, try and do an inclusive, positively worded code of conduct. So I finally recovered from my initial trauma in IRC, and I decided to sort of poke my head out and start contributing a little bit. And so instantly, I thought, well, you know, obviously, for some reason, they think I'm smart because they accepted me in the summer of code. And like, it's open source, so everyone's gonna see what I'm gonna do, and that's gonna be terrifying. So I better sit here and like really work on it really hard and refactor it 500 times before I share it with anyone because I wouldn't want to embarrass myself in front of other people, okay? Does that ring true for anybody in this room? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of nodding, right? Because that's very logical, right? It's like, dude, I'm, I'm like a Drupal person. I don't want to be embarrassed. These people are like really smart. They're gonna look down on me, all this kind of thing. So I would do really smart things, like bash my ta head into a table for three days instead of asking a question I could result in 30 seconds because I didn't want to look stupid. Anyway, so I knocked that off pretty quick. Um, because here's, here's the reality of how things go in the open source world, all right? So we have two profiles here. This you didn't have in your slides because I just made this up on the plane. No. <laughs> <laughs> so we have perfectionist Pat on the left and we have sloppy Sam on the right. So the way perfectionist Pat goes about his Drupal contributions is he gets an idea for a patch. He's like, okay, well, let me start with, you know, tests, of course, because I do test-driven development because I'm a perfectionist, right? And then I'm going to code, I'm going to test, I'm going to refactor, do all that kind of stuff. I'm going to write all my documentation, and those are going to conform 200% to the documentation standards. I am also going to run coder and make sure my module conforms to coding standards. I might go back through this loop a few different times, and then I'm going to go to the issue queue when it's perfect. Okay, so right, that's one way to get it done, right? And there are people out there who have that workflow and it works well for them. Now let's examine what Sloppy Sam does. Sloppy Sam says, I found a bug, let me check in IRC first and see if anybody, uh, you know, has any idea about that. And she gets a response that says, oh yeah, I actually had that bug at a client site last week and I didn't really finish this off, but here's a half working patch for you. And she goes, great, let me take that and you know, clean it up a little bit and post it to the issue queue. So it goes into the issue queue, and it might go into the issue queue in a needs work state, sort of acknowledging I haven't done all the other stuff that you need me to do yet, but there it is, and we can look at it and talk about it. It might get marked back to you know, needs work because it doesn't have tests, so then she might add tests and some docs, post it back to the issue queue, then somebody comes back and says, ah, your coding standards are messed up, blah, 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 this kind of thing. Um, and so, at, you know, looking at that, that looks like a complete mess, right? Like, why would you run your life like that? <laughs> that's, that's just silly. Here's, here's the thing, though. Assuming that Sloppy Sam is not being, like, lazy, because you don't want to do that. You want to be like, I have a problem, write my code for me, right? But as long as she's like, I'm trying to solve this and I'm just having a little bit of trouble with this or that thing, here's what happened. Perfectionist Pete, oh, right, an issue queue again. Perfectionist Pete got plus one karma. He interacted with the community once, and it was a great interaction, but it was a one-time thing. But Sloppy Sam, you know, she first talked to IRC, then there was some issue queue chatter, then there was more issue queue chatter, and saying, she's got a plus four thing, because she's now been in the community. She's provided transparency around what she's working on. She's friendly, and she's, you know, obviously keen and kind of go-getter. The community is going to get to know who Sloppy Sam is way before they know who Perfectionist Pat is. The other danger with this flow is that she could be doing all of this while you're still writing code. And if you're out of the loop on what's happening there, you're gonna have a really frustrating situation when you get to here and you find out somebody's already written your patch, except they got reviewed by the documentation maintainer and the coding standards maintainer, thus it's way more perfect than your perfectionist thing. So don't do this if you can help it. Rese you know, the, the, the main lesson you have to learn is you need to fail early, fail often, and fail in public because that really, ironically, is a way to Drupal success. All right, so I'm okay with failing. I'm, I'm starting to kick some ass. All right, uh, let's go, you know. So I started working on my module, and then I worked on core. That was my first core patch. That was pretty much the best day of my life. That was pretty cool. Um, by the way, it was number 65, so back then that was what was a long issue. Nowadays it's like 400 comments, but anyway. Um, and then I started documenting things I didn't understand at all. Um, and I didn't always get that right the first time. Like, I just try my best and then, you know, kind of show it to people. And they're like, oh, that's pretty good, but you missed this, this, and this. Because people will help you with that kind of stuff. What they can't do is sit there and write this whole thing, but once it's written, they're very happy to tweak it and make it right. Um, and I can't tell you how much you learn a topic by sitting down and doing this. You know, so the next time you find yourself, like, I'm trying to figure some stupid panels problem out for a client, and there's no docs. Oh, Earl Miles, why do you do this to me? 
Just like write the docs, okay? And then show it to Earl and ask him if it's right or not. And yeah. Um, I was also doing dorky things like this. This is a very terrifying thing. Back in the day, that, I was like the second best designer in the Drupal community at that time. <laughs> terrible, <laughs> terrible, terrible. I'm so glad that that's not the case now. But the lesson we learned here is you need to encourage diversity in your contributions, right? Because it ain't just about the code. You have no idea how someone's gonna come into your community. They might come in through code, like I came in through code and then I got into these other things. But some people come in through documentation, some people come in through event management, you literally have no idea. Um, and to drive this point home, when we ask what's a contributor, you know, a lot of people think that means a hairy, sweaty developer like me, like chugging jolt, gold, and rrr, you know. But no, it's like someone who has three attributes. They see something and they say, that is dumb. They also say, I wanna see it fixed, that's important, because I see lots of things that are dumb, but I don't care enough about them to fix them. <laughs> And then they say, I can do something about it. Those are the people that power open source. And a lot of people think I can do something about it means you know, coding, but that's not what it means at all because these are just a sampling of different ways that you can actually help move those things forward. So if you're really mad because Drupal doesn't have such and such a feature, hold a sprint about it in your offices. You know? Or donate to somebody who's looking for funding to fund that feature. Or you know, once it's getting developed, usability tests. If you have access to people who are not Drupal experts, a lot of us don't. A lot of us, our closest companions are our cats. So you know, we would love to have some. If you have Internet Explorer, that is a completely valuable yes. contribution yes. that you can do. All of those things, and then coding too at the tail end of it. Okay, so don't get caught up if you're not if you don't feel like you're a strong developer. There's still plenty for you to do. So then we get to 2006, and this was the uh, Open Source CMS Conference. So this was the first DrupalCon in North America. And not coincidentally, I live in Vancouver now, for a good reason. But anyway, uh, my mind just was blown coming to this conference, because I, I, just, I sat there and I met all these people that I only knew from online, and found out that in real life, they're super awesome. Like, they're down to earth, friendly, funny people. And I, I believe even, what are we, seven years after that, I believe that that still holds true today. Like I feel like we have a pretty great community still. Um, you know, goes out to drinks together, they get together in code and all that kind of stuff. And speaking of that, um, so this is the uh, code sprint again less led by Mosh. This was back when we were working really hard to try and get Drupal 4.7 out. Does that ring a bell to anyone? <laughs> so we're gonna be doing these a lot in the next couple months with uh, Drupal 8 and stuff like that. But, you know, most just was like, you know, we have to get the release out, here's a list of the issues we gotta fix, and he'd be like, you, you take this one, you take that, and it was great. Cause I like actually got chosen to work on something, and you know, what's that? <laughs> I don't think I'm not, I didn't think there was a moment at that DrupalCon I was not smiling. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I know, it was great, you know, it was like all this stuff. Anyway, so provide opportunities to meet in meet space, because it's so valuable. You know, the amount of work that we get done in like three days at a DrupalCon is just astronomical when compared to, the, and that's how you meet like the real people behind the screen names. Because a lot of times in, in the issue queues it's very business oriented. It's like, you know, fix that, fix this, fix this. And then you talk to this person in real life and it turns out they have a Transformers collection and whatever, you know, like that kind of stuff. Um, in Drupal we have local user groups. Um, so I know there's one group for Australia. Is there more than that though? There's subgroups. Because like I said, that's a very big region, Australia. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So chances are there's a, there's a local user group in your region, no matter where it is. And if there's not, what's that? Well, it's, 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 an old, it's an old graphic. Okay, that was lame, I'm sorry. All right, worst talk ever, I know, I know. Anyway, so if there's not a local user group because the pin got left off the map, say, look there first, but if there isn't one, go to an internet cafe and advertise to people that you're gonna be there and see who shows up, you know? Because you never know, there could be Drupal people hiding out in your hometown. We also do regional camps and cons, obviously, because you're at one. Um, but these are cool because they get a more diverse uh, population than you know, a local meetup. A lot of times people miss them, but usually they show up to these. And then sprints. Um, sprints are amazing. It's the opportunity to sort of like go and you know, rub elbows with the people who actually make Drupal happen and become one of those people. 
Um, and, you know, like they've gotten bigger or smaller. We do focus sprints, we do group sprints, all this kind of stuff. And speaking of sprints, there is a sprint on Friday. And so there's two parts to this. One here, if you're uh, new to Drupal development, you don't really know a lot about contributing and stuff like that. Um, Addy in the back there is teaching that uh, class. And it covers Git, development environments, patches, and issue queues. Did I leave anything out? IRC. IRC. It's mostly IRC. Okay, so those things. Um, and so, if you need a refresher on that kind of stuff, go to that, and that's a nicely structured course and all this kind of stuff. Otherwise, the regular code sprint is uh, nine to five thirty, and uh, yeah. So the community tools workshop will be in this room. The code sprint will be in Centennial, which is that way. I understand. Um, and all that stuff is on Saturday. Yes. Shoot. No, I didn't. You guys are completely insane. I definitely didn't do that. Uh, okay. I don't know what you're talking about. That clearly says Saturday. Okay. <laughs> okay. Moving on. Um, so a few months later, Drupal 4.7 was released. Yay! Okay, we were all happy about that. And then the next day, Dries posted this, which was a post asking for personal battle plans for the next Drupal version. And so this was pretty cool because it wasn't feature requests, right? And it wasn't for like wish lists. Oh, I wish Drupal 5 came out with this. But instead it was like, what are you going to work on? You know, which was really empowering. And so some people said, you know, Adrian said, I'm going to work on dependencies or install profiles. We can do distributions. Uh, Handelar said, I'm interested in anyone who wants to like make a new theme that doesn't look revolting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I'm a total underachiever, so this was mine. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I think I didn't do half of the things on that list, and I ended up helping with other people's stuff. Did you fix signatures? No. Sadly, I did not fix signatures. I almost fixed signatures in Drupal 6, but they still don't show up on the node in a forum. I know. It's, it's one of my great life regrets. I kind of am scared to fix that, though, because I feel like if I fix that, then my mission for Drupal would be done, and I would have nothing more to live for. So, you know, I'm just kidding. So in your own communities, cultivate a duocracy. Because if you empower people who are passionate about your topic to act without having to ask anybody for permission or that kind of thing and feel ownership over what they're doing, they can amaze you with what they can do. 2007, I started taking on all of these other roles because I don't know how to say no to anything. Um, in 2008, something cool happened. So some friends of mine um, basically nominated me for this award that I got at OSCON for best contrib contributor. Um, and then later that year, I got named a core committer. So that was a big year for me. Um, not, no pressure or anything. Anyway. <laughs> um, but it's important to recognize contributors because most of us don't really need a pat on the back, but it does help, you know, if you're going to like do a lot of stuff. And also, if you see someone who's exhibiting leadership qualities, you know, give them an opportunity to shine. You know, say, hey, I like what you're doing there. What would you think about, you know, stepping that up a level. And they might go, ah, and freak out and leave, but they might also step up and surprise you. So, you know. so we do these things called community spotlights. We're actually terrible at doing these community spotlights. We need to be better at it. But the goal is to give the limelight to people who may not be very well recognized yet at the time. Not now anymore, <laughs> but you know. Um, but sort of highlight their contributions and also show them that they're real people. You know, a lot of people think you know you get up on a stage and suddenly you're some kind of you know god or whatever, you know. But it's not that Jess isn't a god, but you know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's just like show them the real place, show the journey that they went through and stuff like that. We also do some metrics, so we uh, added this really cool. Um, we added this cool mentoring field. So you can go on your Drupal.org profile and you can say the people who mentored you. And I tried for like a weekend to figure out social graph programs and it was really and it's hard. Web chick in letters this big, so it's good to see the other name. She's not telling you the real reason. But anyway, <laughs> the point is, no. But this is really neat. You know, it's like a really cool metric that's very inclusive and that kind of thing. We also do this metric, which I'm less thrilled about. This is the metric where we take everybody um, you know, who contributed to core and then blow up their names according to how much they've contributed, which is cool. I mean, it acknowledges some people are making a really big effort, um, but it's not very balanced. So like some people whose names are huge are doing huge architectural refactorings. Other people are just fixing a lot of typos. You know, so it's not perfect. So you want to be careful of leaderboard style things like this because they can create kind of a weird environment. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's true. I, I try to always credit major reviewers when I commit patches, um, but I, I don't know if that's true across the board. And, um, and you're right, and a lot of times people who review the patch, which can, which can often be almost as hard as, or harder, yeah, than writing the patch the first time, uh, aren't credited in this. So anyway, it's a way to do a metric. It's not necessarily the best way. But the point being that people do like to see themselves recognized when they do something good. They don't want to see themselves working their ass off and not nobody noticing. So kind of back to that whole thing about. Is that one just based on tweets? Or yeah, this is based on. It's Exactly, yeah. yeah. That's why it's a so shitty, it's a darn tootin' crappy metric. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's not, it's not great. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's one thing that we have um, to do that. It looks really cool, so that's why I keep doing them. But you know, people can get kind of hurt feelings on them and stuff. So. Um, so from 2001 to present, basically what I've been working on is growing Drupal. Um, you know, so my job at uh, Acquia is basically finding the biggest pain point in Drupal at any given time and trying to solve it. So when I started, the biggest pain point was nobody was using Drupal 7. So I was like, okay, let's dig into here and figure out how we can fix that so people start using Drupal 7. So we did stuff like set up a little you know, website to track the progress of module porting and did some direct outreach with you know, contributors to modules, set up some sprints, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff, try and do that. Then it was like the collaboration tools on Drupal.org suck. And they still suck, but they suck a little less now Yay, um, and just different things like that. Um, the big thing that you, I took away from this is you need to learn how to scale yourself, you know, because I can't do the things I used to be doing in the community anymore. I can't mentor people one-on-one -on -one a lot of times, you know, stuff like that. So you really want to help nurture others along your path. You know, if you see those really cool people that look like they've got a spark of like, ooh, you know, you look like you could be awesome at this, reach out to them and try and nurture that, you know. Um, because if you're doing your job really well, you'll render yourself completely irrelevant and then you can just do what you want to do. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and don't forget to take time for yourself, too. I forget to do that all the time, but I should probably stop. So to recap what we learned, um, you want to corrupt young minds, especially the girls. Um, you want to destroy Einstein. You want to do mentoring in your communities, help new people come in and, uh, and be included. Uh, full frontal nicety. Always remember that whenever you inter interact with anyone, you're representing your community, whether you're wearing that hat or not. Um, you want to fail early, often, and in public, so that you get those touch points with the community. They start to learn who you are. Um, you want to encourage diversity, both in contributors and in contributions, because that's how people see that person that they look up to and they go, oh, they're obviously doing okay here. Maybe I belong here too. Or they see some task that, you know, oh, I could actually work on that because I have a background in that. Um, you want to meet in meet space as much as possible. Uh, cultivate a duocracy. It sort of spawns this feeling of ownership in your project. Recognize your contributors who are doing great stuff, and then also work on scaling yourself so that you don't have a bus factor of one. Questions? I think I have 15 minutes, maybe? Something like that. No questions. I answered all your questions. Perfect. You guys were so chatty during the talk. Uh, yeah. I can let you go early if you want, but. Let us go. <laughs> well, I did bar the doors from the outside, so. Uh, <laughs> no. I don't know. What have you, I mean, we're a small enough group. Like, what have you guys found? What's your bidding to your experience in the Drupal community? Is it similar to that? Like, are there yes. other things? Yes? <laughs> what is that? I'm sorry? Oh, way back. Okay, me and you are like soul brothers from another mother or something. Yeah, <laughs> except I'm not a boy. But anyway, yes. Um, that's cool. That experience of being intimidated by people who you see as being your text of confidence, and all it just takes is one person to reach out and say, hey, you can help too. And that's, yeah, it's a real gift. So that experience, I'm repeating for the recording, that experience of being really intimidated and seeing people who look technically stronger than you, but then that one person who reaches out to you and says, hey, you can do this too. That's really important. Chicks did that for me. And Chicks did that for you. Chicks did that for me as well. Yeah. So the question is, if you're, if you're not very strong technically, but you still want to help 
uh, in the community and contributing, what are some ways to do that? Is that correct? Um, so there's lots of different ways. Like, what, what, what are your skills? What do you enjoy doing? Like, what's fun for you? Learning, okay, so just broad learning anything, okay. Well then you can become technical if that's really what you're interested in. You know, you could download the Drupal ladder distribution and go through that as sort of a self-paced thing. Maybe team up with a buddy and do that. If you don't really have an interest in being technical though, um, there's a lot of different things that you could do. Um, for example, there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff on like, particularly project management kind of stuff, we suck at really badly. So if you happen to have a talent at that, or marketing, we're also terrible at that, uh, we're also pretty terrible at graphic design, unless you're Morton. Um, you know, like, you know, we're, we're, a lot of these skills that are non-technical are things that we're really weak in. And I think it's hard for me to pinpoint specific instances where like, oh, this is something that really needs help because I'm in this technical domain and it's hard for me. Because mostly how it works in the Drupal community is you just see something that's not being done and you just jump in and start doing it. I mean, that's how I wrote the form API reference, right? Because I was like, I don't understand this new form API at all, and neither does anybody else. So let me see if I can figure this out, you know. But I never, never like asked anybody, is it okay if I write documentation for this? Because nobody would have known how to answer that. They're like, uh, yes, I don't know, you know. So I mean, what I would ask you, know, you if you're interested in learning, is try and narrow that down a little bit. Like if you're interested in learning on mobile technologies, you're interested in learning on, you know, anything, you could try and pick an area of the community, like say a Drupal 8 initiative, or a particular module, or something like that, and, and you know, form a relationship with the people leading up that. That's a lot easier to jump into than like this huge issue queue with a bunch of things going on. Yeah. You can also, I'm sorry, you can also like, try the sample set, like um, for the change office hours, and I'm gonna see what Andrew was talking about. Um, we have a whole set of tasks that are completely non-technical tasks. So there's a way to sort of introduce yourself to, like, if you want to help with, with Drupal, contributing to Drupal, but you don't necessarily know a programmer or you want to become a programmer, you can start out with a simple task like writing a summary of the issue. And so you might not understand all the technical details, but you can sort of understand what's happened so far by reading through it. And that will help you learn a lot about a particular problem. And it also is something that you can move forward and help prevent what you need to read better. So we have all these different kinds of tasks. And if you cut, it's very low, Yep, and Lee, you head it up most of the time, right? Um, I'm the RAM. <laughs> I suggest the same about Dominic as well. I see the first thing what you have to talk with is to just try a new thing. Mm -hmm. I think I used my first six months back in 2006, just as a demo server, just figure out, so how to do this, how to do that, and so I what the fuck, I actually understand this now, I can help people out. And then after six months, I got kind of yeah, <laughs> that's good to find that in yourself and say it's time for me to you not be in support of it. Yeah, yeah, I get it. No, that's a good point. So Morton was saying that um, one of the things that helped him learn Drupal really well was uh, going into the support channel and sort of listening what other people were asking and sort of trying to figure that out. I mean, that's how I learned Drupal as well because it was before there were books and stuff. Um, it's actually a really great way to learn Drupal, and you also help other people in the process. And, and, and it's the thing I figured out that on the mobile platform, the amount of, of oh, we want to help you, that kind of, it's, I mean, I've, I've experienced other open source communities, I will not mention names, to be fair, but have been very, uh, kind of the I know everything kind of attitude, so it's very much been knocking heads and battling over everything, but this community has been more of the, oh, you also like this blue dot thing, and you don't really <laughs> and, uh, um, you, and how do we even you know, do this stuff? So you kind of come into that, and then you suddenly go down to a conference with these people, and then you kind of are cooked, and then you're in Australia. I mean, on the yeah. beach, yeah. yeah. On the beach, like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> so Morton was saying that, um, you know, one, one thing that's unique about the Drupal community as opposed to other open source communities, where he's kind of seen, in some communities, there's like sort of this jostling for position as far as who's the expert, you know, it's like, 
you know, you're, you're both trying to answer somebody's question, but you're trying to one-up them and how you answer it and that kind of thing. And that the Drupal community isn't really like that. Um, we more are like, oh, you're excited about this thing too? Well, so am I, and here's what I know, and what do you know? Oh, you know that? I didn't know that. That's great. And there's like a lot of this kind of thing, and that, you know, that's what kind of causes people to come to events like this. So to some extent, we're preaching to the choir, because you're here, obviously, but unless you're watching this on video. Um, in which case, please come to a DrupalCon, because can I hear it for DrupalCon? Yeah. Woo! Yeah, all right, cool. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. I, I think that's, that's what, and I think it, it might be a large part to Dries and the way he, you know, runs things. Because I've, I've seen project leads in other open source community, and there's very much a trickle down effect, not to use a Reaganism, but, you know, if the project lead thinks that they're hot shit and full of themselves and that kind of thing, generally speaking, they'll cultivate a, an environment of people like that because they see themselves in the leader and they say, oh, this is a place where I can, you know, be a, I don't know why people do that. So I, I have no idea what the draw is. Whereas Dries is very humble and he tends to like very much cultivate this environment of knowledge sharing and mentoring and, and this kind of thing. And that also has a similar trickle down because you see someone you know, who, who has those qualities and it tends to attract people like that too. So. Anyone else? No? So sad. Okay, cool. Um, thanks everybody for coming. I really appreciate it.